just did a video, uh, which I, I did in Idaho, actually, earlier, and I put it up just two days ago, uh, concerning how inappropriate this book is, and we've been looking at that, and we've been doing quite a few uh, videos on the Quran, and showing how inappropriate it is irrelevant it is for today and we are looking at women's issues and one of the issues that came up was the muta marriages we went back to chapter 4 verse 24 surah 4 ayah 24 of the quran and i was there in idaho and i was standing between those two very red beautiful bushes with the state capital behind me and i just mentioned muta marriages as a how irrelevant it is and that it's very much like prostitution Little did I know while I was traveling in Idaho, little did I know that there was a broadcast going on in England on BBC of all places on this very subject. And I had I, I want to thank David Wood because I happened to look at David Wood's video on the subject. It was done back in October 3rd of this month of 2019. And here BBC had put out a video on the very subject I had just recorded, which helps me because in some ways that shows that it's still going on today. Muta marriages. Because one of the comebacks you always get from many Muslims is, yes, this was for way back in the uh, way back in the, the time of Muhammad. It only existed during his time. In fact, he eradicated it. He sanctioned against it before he died. Therefore, it's not something that's relevant for today. And uh, we, uh, that, what, in fact, when I ended the video, I said, okay, but it's still in the Quran. It's still in chapter 4, verse 24. You're going to have to deal with it. It does look like to me, if it's in the Quran, then it should still be relevant for today. Well, here BBC has done me a favor by showing where it's being practiced. And I, we all know it's being practiced, but I didn't know it was, it was being practiced on such a level. If you have a chance, and I'm going to put the, uh, for those of you who don't live in Britain, you can't go up on iPlayer and see it for BBC, but you can. Go uh, for those of you who lived outside of Britain, uh, you can go to uh, Amazon and other places, and you can see it. It's it's called Iraq's secret sex trade, undercover with the clerics, and it was broadcast on the third of October this month of October, meaning just earlier this month. So, go up and see it. Go up and watch it. It's only an hour long. You're not going to believe what you're seeing because it's proof that this is still happening today. They go, the reporters do go, have to go undercover because you can't just walk in and report on something like this in a Muslim country. And so they had to get Muslims themselves to do the, uh, uh, the journalistic reporting. And they went to the Al Qadima, Qadimiyah, sorry, mosque, the Al Qadimiya mosque in Baghdad, a very famous shrine. It's a place where many people go. In fact, they're having their big festival. Uh, earlier, and that's why they were there. And they wanted to find out about these muta marriages, or the, in Sunni it would be misyad, muta for the Shiites. This is a, in this part of Iraq, and certainly in this part of Baghdad, uh, at this shrine, these were all Shia. And so they went to different clerics, and these are clerics, these are holy men, these are clerics, Islamic clerics, who put together certificates of marriage on any kind of marriage normal marriages as well as muta marriages. And so they went up to and they were more interested to see if they, they would do muta marriages with them. And they went to a guy named uh, Hussein al-Masawi, uh, his office right next to the shrine. And they asked him, would he do muta marriages? And he said, yes, of course. And they asked, well, what, the, what would be the reason that he would give certificates for this? And his response is, well, this is to help the poor women and to get the men closer to God. And when they asked him, well, well, isn't this prostitution? He was very careful, saying, no, 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 this has nothing to do with prostitution because that's illegal. This is legal. Ironically, it is illegal in Iraqi law to do muta marriages, but it's not illegal under Islamic law. And so therefore these clerics were didn't really re, uh, care about legal law. They were looking at Islamic law. For them, that took precedence. Now, it wasn't just this one man that they asked. They asked quite a few. They went to another guy named Saeed Rad, and they asked him if he would be willing to set up a marriage. And right on camera, he did it. In fact, he did it over the phone, in the car, and then he received his $200 for doing it. He, that was his cut. That some of it, I guess, would go to the woman as well. 
But this Sayyid Durad, Sayyid means he, was, he, he would have been in the line of the Prophet himself. So this is not just any incidental cleric. This would be one who is going to be one of the, one of the men, top of the men. In fact, it came out in the, the documentary that he was a follower of Al-Sistani. Al-Sistani is the senior cleric there in Iraq, the most highly respected of the clerics and the one that won the election. <clears throat> now, what's fascinating, Sayyid Durad, when they asked him, well, how young can we have these girls? He said, anywhere above nine years of age. And when they went on to push and say, well, what can we do with these girls? He was very clear right on camera, though he didn't know he was being filmed, uh, that you can do anything, though you cannot, she cannot lose her virginity. She cannot use, lose her virginity. And so therefore, you can touch her, do anything you want with her, you can, but you must go in from behind. It, what he was referring to is anal sex, so that she would not lose her virginity. That was the only thing that he had stipulated against, unless, of course, she agreed. And I said, and you just sit there and just agonize as you're watching this documentary. They went to Karbala, which is the most holy city in Iraq. And they went to a Sheikh Salawi. Again, he said, uh, uh, any girl above nine years is perfectly legitimate. And again, he also made very clear that, uh, that you can go from behind, but don't do penetration from in front, because then the girls would lose their virginity. <laughs> After a while, you said, well, maybe these are just the one or two they happen to get. And then it turns out that of all the clerics, and they asked quite a few clerics, of all the clerics they asked, eight out of ten of them supported muta marriages. Eight out of, that means 80% of the clerics they asked were supportive and would have done and would have given certificates for muta marriages. They went back to this this fellow, Saeed Durad, later a second time, and they said, listen, we don't have a girl in mind. Could you provide us a girl? And right there on camera, he provides a girl. She's, uh, she's uh, out of focus so that you can't see her identity. And they took this footage and they showed two experts there in London. Uh, the lady who is a social worker, fascinating. She, she says it seems that after decades of working for our rights, we lost them overnight, she says. And then she goes on and says, once the Islamic clerics ruled, the first loser is the woman. What a, what a mouthful to say. And she basically underlined exactly what's wrong with this whole trade. Once the Islamic clerics ruled, the first loser is the woman. Now, they then went back and they showed, well, how is it that so many of these muta marriages happen? What is going on? And one of the things that I thought was fascinating, they went back to a marriage bureau in Karbala, and they went to look at marriages taking place. These are legitimate marriages that are taking place, and they were noticing that a lot of them were very young. Some of them were 13, 14, and 15. And now remember, the age, the legal age in Iraq is 15, so many of these were underage. And the cleric was just kind of putting his hands up and saying, I still sign them because what can you do? Have to do so. But what, when they went to talk to the social worker right next door, when she says, you know, almost every one of these, the majority of them get divorced then. They don't last very long, these very young men, because once they are no longer young, they're no longer useful. And so they get divorced. And remember, in Islam, all you need to do is say three times, talak, talak, talak. Once they get divorced, there is no recourse for them. They're not accepted by their family. They're not accepted by their community. So they are prime candidates by these clerics. And these clerics find out who these these girls are that have been divorced. And they are still girls. They're still very young. And they interviewed one or two. In fact, they, the one that they, they, they used actors, of course. But when they interviewed, using the exact words that, she, that this girl had said, and she was in tears. And she says, you know, I had no other recourse but to become a prostitute. Once I have had once I've had one of these marriages, then I go into muta marriages. So this muta marriages then became a means to continue to receive funds, to take care of themselves because their family weren't taking care of them. And it was a whole racket, and it was all controlled by these clerics. All controlled by these clerics. Now, that's the movie itself. That's the documentary. You're going to have to watch it if you want to see more of it. What I found was fascinating is what David Wood brought up. David Wood then went back and he found out that, that, that there was a petition in Britain on the 15th of October. So this documentary had been filmed on the 3rd of October. Where, uh, but within 12 days, 17,000 Muslims had put together a petition in Britain. In Britain, not, not in Iraq. This is in Britain. To demand that BBC remove from iPlayer 
this documentary about pleasure marriages. As they said, they put the petition together demanding BBC removed from iPlayer its pleasure marriages, which expose on, uh, an expose on how Iraqi Muslim clerics sell young girls for sex because they felt it's disrespectful to Shia Islam. It's, by the time the Daily Mail had already gone to print it, that signatures, the signature had gone to over 20,000. Uh, we're now another week later, and I imagine it's gone to probably uh, 30,000. And the reason all these people signed it is because they said that it is misleading and will lead to increased Islamophobia in the UK. That was the reason. They were not, it wasn't that they were upset. They were upset. Of course, they were upset with what they were seeing. What they were most concerned by is that this puts a bad name on Islam. That was their only concern. What was fascinating, as I read that, and as I watched that documentary, and as I listened to that social worker, and as I listened to the other scholar that they brought on, who just spent the, much of the movie just being shocked and shocked and shocked all over again. He used to be a cleric. Now he's back in Britain. He's no longer a cleric. And his view was, this is terrible. This is awful. This is going to really, this is just, this is really going to be, bring disrespect to Islam. What was fascinating, nowhere in the documentary, though it was a whole hour long, and nowhere in this Daily Mail uh, petition or anything that I see in any of these uh, these accusations and also certainly the response and repercussions by the Muslims. Nowhere did I hear anybody talk about why is it that these clerics are doing it? Where is it they're getting it from? Why is it if it is against the law, the secular law in Iraq for these muta marriages, if it's against uh, a law for anybody that's 15 or younger to have these temporary or to have any marriages, then why is it so rampant? Why is it eight out of ten clerics that they talk to are, perf are performing these marriages? What is it about these clerics that won't make them perform? Is it just money? No, it's not just money. And why is it that these men are doing it? Where are they getting it from? What's their motivation? Why is it we don't have this in Britain? Why is it we don't have this in Europe? Why is it we don't have these kind of marriages, these temporary marriages, done by priests and pastors? Why is it that we don't see this in Christianity? And this did not come out anywhere in this documentary. And I'm sitting there scratching my head and I said, if you just look at the Quran, you'll see why it's there. But don't just look at the Quran. Also look at the traditions. Take and go back and see if Muhammad participated in this, if Muhammad supported this. And what we're going to find is not, it's not just in the Quran in chapter 4, verse 24. It's right through the traditions. Right through the traditions, we can see this practice being supported. Let me just share some of them with you. I think it's important that we do share some of this so you can see that I'm just not talking uh, off the sides of my mouth. When we go back to Islamic traditions, we will see that is muta marriages are well attested and supported by Muhammad. Let's start with Sahih Bukhari in volume 7, hadith number 52. He writes about it and he says this, Allah's apostle came to us and said, You've been allowed to do the muta marriage, so do it. Allah's apostle said, If a man and a woman agree to marry temporarily, their marriage should last for three nights. And if they like to continue, they can do so. And if they want to separate, they can do so. Sahih Bukhari. Now remember, Sahih Bukhari is the most authoritative of all the hadith writers. He is the first to write it down. Sahih means he is perfect. There's nothing in error. So it's clear that Muhammad permitted muta marriages during his lifetime. Sahih Bukhari mentions that also Ibn Abbas permitted muta marriages in volume 7, 62, hadith number 51. I heard Ibn Abbas giving a verdict when he was asked about the muta with the women, and he permitted it. This is called Nika al muta Not only Sahih Bukhari, but Sahih Muslim also refers to muta marriages where he writes, there came to us the proclaimer of Allah's messenger, who said, Allah's messenger has granted you permission to benefit yourself, in other words, to contract temporary marriage with women. That's in Sahih Muslim, volume 16, Hadith 16. And it seems like this continued even after Muhammad. I've always heard that, no, Muhammad shut it down and that during his lifetime, after the raids, there was no reason for them anymore because the raids were finished. Then he, uh, in the last few years of his life, he shut it down and didn't continue it. Well, that's not what the traditions tell us. Uh, let's look and see what Sahih Muslim says in volume 8, hadith number 3248. They made a mention of temporary marriage, whereupon he said, Yes, we had been benefiting ourselves by this temporary marriage during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet and during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. Those are the 
first two caliphs, Abu Bakr followed by Umar. Abu Bakr ruled from 632 to 634. Umar ruled uh, from 634 to 644. So certainly it continued after Muhammad's uh, death, continued well after Muhammad's death for at least 10 years. Tirmidhi is another one that refers to muta marriage. Tirmidhi is another one of the six uh, authoritative hadith compilers. And he says this, the temporary marriage applied only in the early days of Islam. A man would come to a settlement where he had no acquaintance and marry a woman for a period. It was thought he would stay there and she would look after his belongings and cook for him. So in Tirmidhi, hadith number 942, we find that. Furthermore, according to Sahih Muslim, there is further proof that not only Muhammad, but Abu Bakr and Umar permitted muta marriages. In Sahih Muslim, uh, volume 16, hadith number 18, it says, And then they made a mention of temporary marriage, whereupon he said, Yes, we had been benefiting ourselves by this temporary marriage during the lifetime of the Prophet and during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. And then you have al-Buhari, who actually refers to the fact that there's nothing in the Quran that forbade it. Fascinating. That's why temper marriages were okay, because we can't find anything, he says. Let's read what he says. We performed it with Allah's apostle, and nothing was revealed in the Quran to make it illegal, nor did the prophet prohibit it till he died. But the man who regarded it illegal just expressed what his own mind suggested. Suggesting, that's Sahih Buhari, volume 6. Book number 60, hadith number 43. So whether it was practiced and then annulled, or whether it was for three days or 90 years, or whether the woman was adequately paid or not, what is quite evident is that this practice of temporary marriages, where a woman is paid for sexual favors, is really nothing more than prostitution. It should not be a practice permitted by married religious men, today or any day, here or anywhere proving just once again just how inappropriate the Quran is as a book for us, for me, for you, for anyone. I thought maybe certainly this was to have stopped with Muhammad, but it looks like it's still being practiced today. And the reason is very simple. If you look at the Quran, this book, you look at chapter 4, verse 24, and you look at the traditions, you can see that it was practiced long after Muhammad. This was not something that he annulled. Looks like it's going to be practiced today, and until you confront it in this book and confront it in the traditions, you're going to see it happen over and over and over again. We just looked at Iraq, uh, the BBC did so, but uh, I would imagine that Buddha marriages are found all over the Muslim world. As sad as that is to say, that's the reality we have to live with. Okay, here's Jay. It's not the easiest material to work on, it's not the easiest material to share with you. Nonetheless, we need to know what's happening, and we need to know what's happening in our own day. Back here in my office, 